Good morning. Um, my name is Charles Clancy, and I am a professor in electrical and computer engineering here at Virginia Tech. Um, I also direct the Hume Center for National Security and Technology. Uh, we're a research uh, and uh, uh, experiential learning center that was established about uh, eight years ago. Um, and our focus is really around getting students interested uh, in uh, careers uh, in national security. So we have relationships with many of the intelligence agencies and, and across the uh, Department of Defense and the various companies that support them. And um, as such, uh, cybersecurity has been a key area that we've been working on from a research perspective. Uh, so it is in that context uh, that, that David invited me to participate. Um, so this morning I'm going to be talking about blockchain uh, perhaps from a computer scientist point of view, uh, my goal is to kind of give you an idea of some of the magic uh, behind the curtain uh, that I think is uh, really underpinning the technology uh, to try and, and show what really is so unique about it. Uh, and then I intend to talk a bit about some of the applications in cybersecurity uh, that we're seeing uh, sort of emerging, which are, are very interesting, and really get at the, the heart of this notion of trust and uh, beyond uh, financial transactions and things like Bitcoin, uh, where are the other applications for blockchain? <clears throat> so, um, let me, I guess, give you a little bit of uh, computer science history. Um, uh, so, in, in the 1990s, there was a, a somewhat provocative proposal for dealing with uh, what were called denial of service attacks. So, in computer science and in cybersecurity, you have these denial of service attacks where you have some um, broker that is offering a service, uh, and then you have many clients that seek to uh, consume that service. Uh, and there are scenarios where uh, clients can make way more requests than they actually need. Uh, of that service with the goal of congesting that service and preventing it from effectively operating. Uh, today we have this problem globally on the internet uh, with the distributed denial of service attacks where many thousands of computers will all be controlled by a, a single group uh, with the goal of disrupting a, a single point on the internet with large amounts of traffic or queries. Um, so one of the ideas that was proposed in the 1990s was this notion of proof of work. So, uh, rather than uh, trying to solve this through, say, cryptography and authentication, basically the idea is if uh, you are a, 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 a service on the internet that provides a function, a service to uh, third parties, uh, rather than just blindly accepting a request from them or a connection from them, uh, first you give them a puzzle to solve. Uh, and that puzzle will take them some finite amount of time to complete, uh, but you'll be able to verify the accuracy of the puzzle quickly. Uh, so it's, it's complex for the client to solve, uh, but something that you're able to compute quickly. Uh, many of you may be familiar with, with CAPTCHA technology. Uh, when you go to websites, you have to type in uh, blurry letters and numbers to prove that you're not a robot. Um, that is a similar technology. It's, it's, it's something that a human can solve easily, but a machine can, is difficult for a machine to solve. This is an example of something where um, uh, the machine can solve it. Uh, can, it's difficult for the machine to solve, but easy to check the solution. Um, and so the uh, solution, that the, the basic premise of this is, uh, you'll see there on the left, this notion of a hash inversion. So essentially what you do is you'll take a, a string of random ones and zeros, and you will put that through a hash function, which is a, an irreversible mapping. Uh, you put 160 bits in, you get 160 bits out. Those 160 bits are different than the 160 bits that went in. Uh, there's always a one-to-one -one mapping between input and output, and if you have the output, it's impossible to reverse to get the input. Uh, without doing an exhaustive search of all possible inputs that have caused that output. Uh, so what they do is they give you this hash puzzle where they give you the output of the hash and they give you a portion of the input to the hash and it's your job to find uh, the remaining bits. And the only way to do this uh, is, is basically through an exhaustive search. So you try all patterns of ones and zeros. So depending on how many bits uh, they ask you to solve for, uh, that is the complexity of the problem. If they only ask you to solve one bit, then you, you just try the hash with a zero there, and you try the hash with a one there, and whichever one of them matches, you're done. Uh, obviously not very computationally challenging. But if they ask you to uh, provide 10 bits, then there's 1,024 different combinations you have to try, and that takes some amount of computational resources. Uh, if there's 20 bits, again, even harder. So you can ratchet up and down the level of difficulty uh, based on uh, the, the amount of delay you want to cause. 
Um, an example of this that I, I personally think would be great if we could figure out how to deploy it on the internet is this notion of email spam puzzle. So uh, if you want to send me an email, uh, the, the email server will send your computer a, a puzzle to solve before you can send it. This would drastically reduce the amount of spam we receive because sending large volumes of, uh, of, of email, I think the internet is 80% is spam in terms of uh, total email volume, uh, would just be computationally uh, intractable for uh, the, the, the spammers that are doing it. So this is concept number one that uh, was done in isolation, but we'll see later comes in to be foundational for the notions of blockchain. Um, the second is what's known as the Byzantine fault problem. Uh, so this problem is actually uh, fairly old. There were solutions to it that were posed in the, in the 1980s, but uh, here we have a problem of N generals, uh, each with their own army. Those N generals have surrounded a city and they need to decide whether it's in their best interest to attack the city uh, or to retreat. And the thing is they need to do it all together. So if half of them attack and half of them retreat, the half that attack will be defeated uh, and, and they won't have achieved their, uh, achieved their objective. So there needs to be a distributed way to make this decision and um, essentially the idea is, is a majority vote. So you have N generals, uh, they need to somehow do a majority vote uh, to decide whether they're going to attack or retreat and then they all need to abide by the vote that they, they cast. The problem is they're all geographically separated so they have to communicate with each other via messenger. Uh, they're not able to just directly communicate with each other in, in the same room. Um, so as a result, uh, there are a variety of, of approaches to solving this. Um, the challenge, though, is that there are traitors uh, that are among the generals who seek to cause disruption. So let's say, for example, you have a scenario where eight, uh, you have nine generals, uh, four of them vote to uh, retreat, four of them vote to attack. Uh, the remaining general is, is traitorous and will tell the group that voted to attack that he or she votes to attack and tell the group that voted to retreat that he or she voted to retreat. Uh, and then you'll have uh, the group bifurcate with half attacking and half retreating, which is not the uh, intended outcome. Um, so solving this problem has been one of those sort of fundamental challenges in computer science and uh, uh, certainly probably something that you would learn in a, a sophomore level class. Uh, but there are, um, so there's a variety of ways to do this. The basic approach is through the use of things called digital signatures. So if I, uh, if I, I cast my, uh, my vote on whether to attack or retreat, uh, that message is then digitally signed and shared with everyone. Um, if I share two copies of my message, the idea is that everyone, all the other generals are sharing among each other the messages they've received from each other. So they're able to recognize when someone is giving a different message to two different uh, parties. Uh, but still, this is, is not, uh, not a, a complete solution. So the simple example is three generals. Um, you have one general who uh, 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 gives an order to attack to one person and an order to retreat to the other. They too then will, will share information with one another. They get conflicting information, but they don't know which of the two. They know that one of the two is traitors, but they don't know which of the two, and therefore they don't know which of the two outcomes to, to, uh, uh, to pursue. So this, this is still a challenge, but for, as, as N gets very large, there are uh, efficient solutions uh, where we can, as long as no more than half of the generals are traitorous, we are able to solve this problem. Again, this was a set of technologies that were developed uh, mostly in the 1980s, and uh, we'll see them show up again uh, as a fundamental component of blockchain. Third is a technology called hash trees. Um, so hash trees are a, a way of providing validation to large, complex data sets. Um, so at the bottom here, we have blocks of data uh, that we seek to uh, verify or validate, and um, uh, there needs to be an efficient structure where if, I, if someone presents you with a data block, you know whether or not it is uh, a legitimate data block uh, with just knowledge of the hash tree. Uh, so the way that works is uh, each of the data blocks goes through a hash function, which I mentioned before is this irreversible um, uh, function, and a, 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 a smaller value is computed. Typically these are 128 or 256 bit uh, hashes. Uh, so each of the data blocks is hashed, uh, and then the hashes are hashed. So you take two, two hashes and hash them together to create another hash that's one level up the tree, and you proceed all the way up to the, the root hash at the very top. And so if someone presents you with a, um, a, a piece of data and you, they, they assert that it's part of this hash tree, uh, you can compute its hash, 
and see if it's part of the tree. You can also then see if, if it's a leaf of the tree. You can also verify whether or not any of the, the, the tree has been, been manipulated or changed because if, uh, if one of the lower level hashes is changed, uh, everyone has to agree to uh, update the higher level hashes or else there's an inconsistency in the tree and you can recognize that someone is, uh, is spoofing or, or modifying information. Again, this was a technology uh, that was, I think, developed in the 1970s and uh, wasn't widely used, but again, finds a home in enabling blockchain technology. So, let's synthesize. <laughs> There's all these disparate technologies that were developed somewhat in isolation, and um, they all come together uh, to create what we know today as blockchain. Um, so blockchain is a, um, at the top, uh, top left there, you will see uh, it's, this, it's a chain of blocks, uh, aptly named. Um, and essentially what happens is each block consists of a, um, a hash tree. It, it contains the root of the hash tree, uh, as I, I ha have here, be that, that top hash at the top. It also includes a nonce, which is a random number. It includes a timestamp of when that block was created. And it includes the hash of the previous block. And so because the block 11 in this case includes the hash of block 10 and block 12 includes the hash of block 11, uh, it creates this chain where they're linked to each other. So if someone attempts to uh, modify, I don't know, the timestamp in block 11, uh, there will be an inconsistency in block 12 uh, because the hash will no longer match. Similarly, if, if someone modifies one of the data elements, uh, the, you'll see at the bottom these TX0 through TX3, those are transactions. If someone attempts to modify one of the transactions, uh, the hashes will then mismatch at some point, uh, either uh, in the hash tree, in the blockchain, uh, or, or regardless, they will be detectable. Um, so you have this, this data structure, this notion of these blocks chained together. Uh, you then have a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, that uh, stores all of these blocks. And so as a new block is formed, uh, this peer-to-peer -peer network agrees to add it to the blockchain, and uh, it then gets integrated in by essentially taking the hash of the, the most recent block that the blockchain has, has agreed to. Um, so at the bottom here, you can see that basic data structure. Uh, the, uh, the green square would be block zero, and each of the black squares would be uh, consecutive blocks moving forward. Now you'll note that there are also uh, purple blocks, uh, and these are what are known as orphan blocks. So there are scenarios where in a peer-to-peer -peer network, you may not immediately achieve consensus. You may have two different parts of this peer-to-peer -peer network that are deciding a new block needs to be formed, and they may form that block and they may add it onto the blockchain. Uh, the challenge you have there is you now have a fork in your blockchain, and you have to decide which fork is correct. Uh, they may both be correct, uh, if it, but essentially what you need to do is, is pick one, otherwise you end up with inconsistencies in the chain. Um, and so what happens is that the network will uh, score uh, each of the forks and decide uh, which path is the appropriate one. It will then sort of disconnect those, uh, uh, those non-selected paths from the primary blockchain. Um, and they are basically those transactions are then not sort of included in the mainline, uh, mainline blockchain. Um, you also, from a regulatory perspective, which I think is going to be a very interesting topic for later today, uh, you can do what's known as a hard fork of your blockchain which is now we're going to ignore the scores that were computed to decide which path to take, but we are going to take a proactive step to decide which path is taken. Um, so there's been a couple incidences where there have been major compromises uh, of, of Ethereum and Bitcoin that have resulted in, in many millions of dollars in theft. Uh, and in those scenarios, there have been occasional decisions to do a hard fork, or essentially uh, the software that manages this peer-to-peer -peer network decides to reject the valid path and backtrack and pick a, a, an old path to essentially erase transactions from this distributed ledger uh, that, uh, that were problematic for regulatory reasons. <coughs> Uh, which perhaps undermines the, uh, it puts the regulatory power of, of some of these things in the hands of the software developers who are uh, uh, maintaining the code that runs the network, uh, which I think is an interesting area that uh, would be a topic of potential discussion during the panel. So that builds us up to the point where we have a blockchain. Um, so now let's take it to the next step and talk about obviously Bitcoin, uh, everyone's favorite implementation of that. So what we bring together is uh, first this notion of mining. I, I talked about this proof of work problem. 
uh, early on, and that is essentially mining of, of Bitcoin, where you are going to use, uh, solve these, these puzzles of increasing d difficulty. When Bitcoin first launched, the number of bits that you had to guess in that hash function was very small, which allowed us to rapidly create uh, initial coins. Uh, but then as those coins have been discovered, uh, the number of bits that you need to guess uh, gets longer and longer and longer and longer, and therefore the time it takes to discover new coins uh, goes up longer and longer and longer. Um, so you get these interesting economic properties associated with it, of course, and then you also have these Bitcoin uh, farms where people are using uh, custom uh, uh, chips to do this at scale. There's a whole conversation around the energy consumption associated with mining coins uh, that have, uh, I guess, no intrinsic value other than what people will pay for them. That is a whole philosophical question that as a, as a computer scientist, I guess I won't, I won't delve into. Um, but uh, anyway, there's, there's sort of, uh, you could almost uh, sort of argue that the, uh, the value of the coins is the, is the price of the energy used to compute the, uh, the new coins. Um, so once you find these, discovery of a coin is a transaction that then gets recorded in the Bitcoin network. Um, and the Bitcoin network also is responsible for uh, storing transactions, a sale of coins or fractions of coins among, uh, among parties. And um, the interesting thing is you have this network of, of devices that are all participating in this large peer-to-peer -peer network. They're responsible for maintaining all this information. They're responsible for being responsive to transactions, people wanting to execute transactions within the blockchain. Um, in general, they need to get compensated somehow. Uh, so in, in the Bitcoin network and in many others, uh, anytime you execute a transaction, you actually pay for that with Bitcoin. Uh, so that there's a, a way, uh, there's a remuneration associated with providing service to the network. Therefore, you're fundamentally incentivized to not mess the network up because if you were to uh, start uh, manipulating the blockchain or try to take over the blockchain, uh, you would potentially be jeopardizing your own um, uh, holdings that you have received over time as part of participating and, and supporting the network. Then, of course, we have the trading, uh, which have, we've seen a massive increase in, uh, over the last, uh, last year uh, with buying and selling coins based on uh, some market-based price associated with those coins. Uh, but that's separate from, uh, I guess, the mining part, which is kind of two different sides. So that is, is kind of uh, state of the art as of, of 2015. And then the question was, well, what does is, what is the next evolution of this technology look like? Uh, well, the next step is what we saw with Ethereum, where Ethereum said, well, uh, the ability to record transactions is, is good. There's all kinds of really interesting applications for that. Certainly cryptocurrency is, is a major application for that. Uh, but Ethereum decided to take a bit further when they, uh, launched, um, their ch th uh, when they launched their blockchain in 2012. And essentially that what they said is, well, what if in addition to just uh, being compensated for recording transactions, what if you had the ability to execute uh, arbitrary software within this network? And you had the ability to uh, write code that would live in the network and be executed by the network and nodes would be compensated uh, for running this code using whatever the unit of, uh, of, of, of currency was. Uh, in this case, it's ethers and, and quote, gas, which is the fuel for uh, executing virtualized computation. Uh, so what Ethereum did was they came up with uh, this concept of uh, virtual machines uh, where you would run an Ethereum virtual machine. It had an entire operating system associated with it. It had many different scripting languages that you could use to program it. And it then became a, uh, a, it really blends this notion of the cloud and, and cryptocurrency all into kind of one really interesting mashup. Um, and this really, I think, unlocked the whole notion of, of smart contracts. Uh, before, uh, this, the notion of a smart contract where, where you have the ability to sort of digitally enforce terms of a contract was really limited to the, the purchase and sale of, of cryptocurrency. That's the, essentially the form of a digital contract that Bitcoin was able to achieve. But with the Ethereum, we have now the ability for much more complex smart contracts to be executed. Uh, and in fact, entire organizations that can be virtually instantiated within, uh, within the blockchain, or and, and, sorry, within this case, the, yes, within the blockchain. Uh, so the sort of peak example of this is, uh, is the DAO, a Distributed Autonomous Organization, um, which is a, uh, a, an entire company, an organization that was established and is operating completely virtually and um, autonomously. It has no board of directors, it has no management, it has no employees. It exists solely as uh, uh, logic that runs in code on this larger network. 
Um, and this particular organization was set up to do uh, venture investment. So all the shareholders, uh, or people that bought into it using their, um, their Ethereum currency, uh, then had the ability to direct where those investments went. And unlike a normal inv venture investor where you have to rely on uh, uh, the venture capitalists to go out and find <coughs> compelling technologies and make good decisions about what to invest in, it completely democratized it in that it allowed um, it allowed the shareholders to directly participate in the decisions about what was funded and what was not funded because there was no management. It was uh, just a collection of computer algorithms uh, that uh, reacted to votes cast by those with, uh, with shares in the organization. Um, so again, very interesting uh, an, uh, entire model where you could have an entire venture capital group that exists solely uh, virtually within uh, the blockchain and it's it's, it has a distributed network of shareholders making decisions about investment. Um, of course, notably, uh, the problem with the DAO was that uh, um, uh, it got hacked. So uh, if you have code that is running in this network, if that code has flaws in its logic or flaws in its construction, uh, then hackers can exploit that. So uh, whenever you, so essentially what happened was the code base got so complicated that even though it was open source and everyone was able to look at it, uh, flaws crept in and hackers found those flaws and then hackers were able to hijack the decision logic and cause about $50 million of their $150 million worth of, of total resources to be siphoned off into separate accounts. Um, so uh, I think there's kind of this notion that blockchain solves uh, sort of all of these security problems that can't be hacked. Um, perhaps the core chain itself can't be hacked, but as we look to build really interesting and complex technologies on top of it, there is the potential that those technologies may not be implemented correctly and may, in fact, uh, be exploited as we, saw, uh, as we saw here with Ethereum. Um, so in, uh, in the world of, of computer science, this, this picture showed up in my Twitter feed last week and I, I found it apropos uh, for, for this event here. Um, but there are many memes floating around the internet around uh, the overhype of blockchain. Um, so there are lots of skeptics, it's sort of a running, so I'm based up in Northern, uh, the Northern Virginia campus and I'm engaged in the sort of tech economy of Northern Virginia. And it's, a, it's sort of a running joke that if you put machine learning or blockchain in, the, in, in the, the, your pitch deck for a new company you're launching, you're guaranteed to get funding. Um, so we're kind of at, at peak blockchain right now in terms of, uh, of hype around the technology. So of course now we're starting to see a lot of skeptics as this hype I think gets, gets inflated. Um, so really it comes down to this key question. Um, when is a centrally managed secure database not good enough for what you're trying to do? Uh, because if I can have a centrally managed database that's based on a set of standards and a schema that everyone agrees to, um, how is blockchain really offering anything new? So for example, if we're talking about digital credentialing, uh, yes, you could use a blockchain to, uh, to do uh, digital credentialing and, and are these people have these particular certifications or these degrees and we can assert to that in a distributed way, um, but is it reasonable for there to be a trusted third party that is responsible for maintaining that information and having a portal that makes it available uh, to everyone? One. So does your problem need to have a completely decentralized trust or not? Uh, similarly with currency uh, and, and the whole notion of cryptocurrency, if you think about uh, banks today, they essentially are big databases uh, and those big databases are mostly secure and centrally managed. Of course there's all kinds of fraud, but that's sort of priced into the cost of doing business. So. Um, the question is, what are the applications really where the decentralization and the fundamental change in the nature of trust is, is, is required in order to be effective? So with that as sort of the backdrop, I want to talk about what I'm seeing in particular in the world of cybersecurity and where there are some interesting applications. Um, so first, in the world of cybersecurity, we have this... Uh, this fundamental notion of, of security, uh, we, there's several fundamental uh, things that you seek to achieve in any secure system. Uh, you want to have confidentiality. So typically you'll encrypt your information so that bad guys can't see it. Uh, you have this notion of um, uh, integrity. You want to make sure that data cannot be altered as it's being sent around the internet, for example. Uh, and so you have things like uh, 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 cryptographic hashes and digital signatures that support that. Um, third, you have this notion of availability, meaning uh, if I am offering a service, it's difficult for some adversary to be able to cause some denial of service that takes that down and, and makes me unable to access my service. Well, a fourth one that is perhaps doesn't get quite, quite as much attention perhaps in the uh, introductory uh, cybersecurity courses here at Virginia Tech is this notion of non-repudiation. Uh, so non-repudiation is uh, basically uh, I uh, do something, 
but then I assert that I, in fact, did not do something. So uh, examples there on the left, uh, one is the notion of repudiation of, of origin, where I execute some sort of, let's say, bank transfer, uh, but then I call up my bank and say, no, that wasn't me, it was someone else who executed that bank transaction. Um, my, credit, my, my American Express credit card seems to get stolen uh, every year. Um, of course, American Express's strategy to this is just to keep incrementing the last digit of my, my number. I think the, the bad guys probably can figure that out. <laughs> um, so about every year, I discover fraudulent transactions on my, on my credit card bill. And so I call them up and say, that wasn't me. Uh, and they remove the charges. Um, well, what prevents me from calling my bank uh, all the time and saying, that wasn't me. My credit card's been stolen. Um, so uh, that's this notion of non-repudiation. So, uh, that's repudiation of origin. The second is repudiation of a mission where um, I actually execute a, uh, a $1,500 transaction, but I call and say, actually, no, it was a $500 transaction. Uh, you, uh, it, the, the content was, was not accurate. Uh, so that's another, another scenario. So um, solving this problem, solving non-repudiation requires, fundamentally requires the notion of a trusted third party. Uh, we use public key infrastructure almost every day to solve this problem. Uh, every time you go to a website and you see HTTPS, that little S means it's using a secure encryption, uh, and there's a public key infrastructure that is uh, enabling that, and there are somewhere around 100 different trusted third parties that your web browser uh, uses in order to decide whether or not any particular website you're going to is, is legitimate. Um, now, there are many examples where those trusted third parties aren't as trusted as we thought. Uh, there was a, a trusted... Um, uh, there was a certificate authority in Germany that was hacked maybe two years ago. Uh, maybe it was probably longer ago than that, maybe three or four years ago. Uh, in that case, it was hacked by Iran, uh, and Iran used the stolen credentials from that certificate authority to generate fake certificates for Google and, and um, Facebook and Yahoo. And so when citizens of Iran would go to any of those respective websites, they were actually going to an Iranian interception system uh, that was decrypting their system, their, their data, and then re-encrypting and sending it on to the legitimate sites. And because that trusted third party was compromised, uh, they were able to do that, uh, and, and the web browsers and systems all trusted that they were, uh, that, that was accurate. So um, that is one of the biggest challenges of trusted third parties, is that in a scalable uh, environment, we need many of them, because there needs to be sort of market forces that help uh, manage all of that. Uh, but when you have many, then the, the weakest link is the one that is, uh, is going to be exploited and therefore breaks the whole system. Another example would be Stuxnet. Uh, so for those of you that, uh, that may remember, in about 2010, um, uh, there were uh, hacks against uh, Iranian uh, uh, nuclear facilities that were enriching uranium. Uh, there was complex malware that was injected into their systems and uh, caused their centrifuges to spin too fast and break. And there was a significant reduction in the um, enriched uranium output of, of Iran over that period of time. Uh, that malware had, uh, was digitally signed. It looked completely legitimate to the Windows operating systems it was being loaded onto, and it was because a, a, a Taiwanese certificate authority had been compromised uh, and was being used to generate false signatures uh, that were being applied to that malware, which allowed it to, to be functional. So, again, trusted third parties, when they don't become so trusted, that's, that's, a, that's one of the big challenges. So as I look at this space, some interesting applications. Well, uh, as was mentioned by David, there's this whole notion of identity and, and trust and what that means. And right now, we rely heavily on a trusted third party to assert our identity. Right now, Google and Facebook seem to be the biggest sources of identity that we have. Um, but everyone sort of obviously is increasingly nervous about uh, Facebook, for example, being uh, the thing that defines our identity. So uh, if there are new ways to define digital identity, uh, then I think there's interesting applications in blockchain uh, for doing that. Um, the second is really this, the ability to address distributed denial of service attacks. These attacks are a major impact on uh, our global uh, internet infrastructure. And if there is the ability for these proof of work puzzles, essentially, uh, to be realized such that, um, I don't know, if I want to it's going to cost me 0 0.00001 Bitcoin in order to open a session to Google.com, for example. Right? Uh, if you had uh, metrics like that in place, uh, then you would be able to significantly ramp back um, uh, uh, these sorts of denial of services. Now, perhaps Bitcoin is a bad example because that applies there's some sort of monetary value associated with your transaction with Google. There are other sorts of, of, of blockchains that perhaps uh, rely on a different notion of proof of work that uh, wouldn't imply some monetary value associated with each internet transaction. 
but really it's about uh, metering the rate at which uh, you can open new connections, therefore limiting dis distributed knowledge service attacks. Um, the third is data integrity and providence. So uh, if, if, if you have uh, a large enterprise with lots of different type of data, um, that data is exposed to all sorts of different threats, um, uh, different ways that it can be tampered with or stolen. Uh, but if you use this hash tree technology as part of blockchain, essentially you can check in all of these documents to, uh, uh, to the blockchain and that helps provide the integrity and provenance. Um, as, a, as a great example, uh, GitLab and GitHub, which is one of the, the major open source software development platforms, uh, they use hash chains already to, to manage all the different commits of code to their systems. Uh, so one of, I had a, a master's student uh, two years ago who's, whose thesis was on essentially not only uh, uh, putting these into the, the GitHub blockchain, or not uh, hash tree, but then also checking them into a, a separate blockchain so that every code commit was, uh, was authenticated by, uh, by a blockchain. And the last is this notion of cloud computation. Uh, the cloud is really taking over um, pretty much everything. As you look at IoT and 5G technologies, it's based on the cloud. Everything becomes a service in the cloud. Your entire cell phone network essentially becomes a service that is running in the cloud. Um, AT&T and Verizon basically become tenants in the cloud and, and marketing uh, is really how the technology is, is, is evolving. And so in these scenarios uh, where everything is cloud, having the ability to um, bring this additional layer of integrity to certain cloud computations uh, with the sorts of things that you see in Ethereum. Now, Ethereum is not quite Turing complete, which is what you need in order to have a fully functional uh, sort of uh, general purpose compute platform, but it's getting a lot closer. Uh, so uh, anyway, interesting area of, of potential additional research where I think there might be some, uh, some, some interesting outcomes. So with that, I am done. Yeah. <laughs> All right.